Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Committee of the Whole for September 9th. Um, at this time, I'll let the clerk call the roll. Councilmember Wood? Here. Councilmember Spitzley? Here. Councilmember Spadafore? Here. Councilmember Washington? Here. Councilmember Dunbar? Councilmember Garza? Here. Councilmember Hussein? Here. Councilmember Jackson? Uh, Councilmember Jackson does have an excused absence. I've not heard from Councilmember Dunbar, so I'm expecting her um, sometime during the meeting. Um, let's see, Councilmember um, Spitzley, we have the minutes for August 26th. Is it August 12th? August 26th. Okay, thank you, Madam President. I move uh, approval of the minutes um, for August 26th. I have a motion on the minutes. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, passes unanimously. This is an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to make a public comment? If you would, please come to the podium. Give your name for the record. Hi, uh, Beryl Schwartz. Uh, I'm coming before you because I understand you have a resolution uh, concerning City Pulse uh, to uh, encourage uh, Kroger to uh, reconsider what we think is uh, an ill-advised uh, uh, change of policy concerning free publications, including City Pulse. Uh, Kroger is the biggest chain in America with over 2,500 stores, uh, many of which are not called Kroger, but are owned by Kroger. Uh, Kroger recently uh, informed those of us who distribute in their stores that free publications will no longer be welcome uh, after, uh, in this market, uh, uh, after September. Uh, their argument is that print is dead. Uh, and uh, I can tell you that at the Kroger stores, uh, in 2012 we were distributing about 1,100 copies. Uh, we are now distributing over 3,000 copies. So that's uh, 3,000 Kroger customers who must be ghosts, I guess. Uh, but uh, this is going on. This is true of free newspapers all over the country. You know, a lot, a lot of uh, a lot of attention has been given to uh, problems with. Uh, uh, print uh, newspapers, but uh, the, that largely pertains to paid newspapers. And in fact, as paid newspapers uh, have problems, print just gets, uh, free newspapers just get stronger. Uh, people want to pick us up. They want to pick up those shoppers that don't have news in them that you can get for free because they have coupons. Uh, they, they pick up the yellow books in great numbers. And uh, so we have asked the city council, as you did with the Meyer stores back uh, about eight years ago when they made a similar decision for other reasons. Uh, we've asked city council if it would please uh, pass a resolution encouraging Kroger to reconsider uh, this decision and the interest, not just in Lansing, but the whole area, but in Lansing alone, there are over a thousand people who pick up their papers at a Kroger store. I appreciate your support on this and thank you for your time. And we do have that under other and we'll be taking that up. Um, later on in committee of a whole and then it is scheduled to be on the agenda uh, during the council meeting so thank you thank you madam president is there anyone else that would like to make a comment at this time just a couple quick things uh, I support what Burl said I'm one of those people who, even though, you know, I may not be 90 or 9, I'm in that gap where I grew up with a newspaper in print. I, re I require a newspaper in print. I still, in spite of the $60 a month that I pay for it, uh, get a print subscription to the State Journal every single day. I cannot go through a day without reading a print paper. Same way with books. Got to be printed. At any rate, uh, going on to budget priorities, I will be down here every time I can between now and when the budget's adopted saying the same thing, the same thing, the same thing. No raises. 
no new infrastructure, no new technology, no new anything at all, even no new parks, until our infrastructure is in place that needs to be and our police are funded adequately and staffed adequately. All those other things are, are wants. They are not needs. We need our roads fixed. We need our sidewalks fixed. We need police adequately staffed and available for calls and we need to stop relying so much on mutual aid to other agencies. If I were another agency, I would be saying to the LPD right now, our citizens are sick of supporting your needs because you won't do it yourself. And we're gonna cut back on what we do with mutual aid because our taxpayers are carrying your burden. We need to get our priorities straight. Our priorities need to be those things versus Wi-Fi in a park and on and on and on. Lastly, um, the Lansing Connect. I am pleased on one hand to report that the three things that I had complaints on have now, as of just last Saturday, been resolved. But secondly, on the other hand, it should not have taken me getting in touch directly with Brian McGrain for that to happen. And that's what was required. So that system still is not up to snuff. It needs work. Something needs to be done to make it more responsive and more reliable. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? Well, I come in here tonight, didn't know about the paper business, uh, read quickly everything, and I have to look at you guys and say, you are so on the money. We have a situation, none of us out in the wildlands know it. We come into council meeting, you've already got it on your agenda, you've already looked into it, you're already talking about it. And I really, there, that hasn't always been the case in years past, as all you that have been on the council for a while know, while know. And I really appreciate the fact that a lot of people would look at this and say, you're talking about the city pulse, a stupid little paper that people pick up. Are you serious? We've got serious things to talk about. Well, I'm gonna tell you, this 85-year-old lady reads her city pulse, and I don't think you've got anything more serious than that. And I appreciate the fact that you thought about us. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the council at this time? Seeing none, um, the way we're going to handle this is we have uh, Christopher Mumby and Brian McGrain here to talk about Lansing Connect. And Christopher um, needs to leave here at 6, so we're going to bring him up first. Council members, in your packet was a memo that had been um, done by, um, I'm, I'm assuming, um, either Christopher or Brian and answering some of our questions on Lansing Connects. After that, we are going to have um, Andy Kilpatrick speak on the Michigan Department of Environmental uh, Great Lakes and Energy Recycling, and then we will do our presentation on economic development. So uh, with that, um, if you'll make sure that the green light is on on the mic. And um, if you could go over, um, even though this was sent on to council members, if you could go over the memo that um, you supplied to us, and then if council members have questions or have additional comments um, that they have dealing with Lansing Connect, we can address them at that time. Christopher. Thank you, Madam President. Appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about Lansing Connect, uh, a program that we think is uh, working well, but not working perfectly, and there are plenty of opportunities to make it better. Um, so we, as you stated, we did uh, prepare some responses to uh, questions that were brought back to us, and I'll quickly go through them, and then in, in certainly more detail for any parts you, you want, and Brian and I will kind of tag team if that's all right. Okay. Um, one of the questions that was key um, was what does it mean to have an issue closed in Lansing Connect? And uh, none of these answers are cut and dry. Um, 
so uh, we provided a long-winded answer, but it means many things depending on what kind of uh, issue it is and what other software it interacts with. Um, so we gave some examples. Um, it could be turned into a work order, and if it's integrated with uh, CityWorks, um, the status in City Sourced, which is Lansing Connect, I know they're similar names, uh, follows the status of the work order. And um, that is not the same case if it is a code issue which interacts with BSNA, the primary software that they use. Um, with, uh, from a code enforcement standpoint, closed means they've either revisited the site and they substantiated a complaint and uh, either the issue has been taken care of by the resident or they find the situation still exists and they dispatch uh, someone to remedy the situation. Oftentimes it's a contractor. Um, they close the situation in BSNA and um, when they receive the bill from the contractor. So it's closed in Lansing Connect when it's dispatched to a contractor, still open in their primary work order system until they determine it's been completed and they got a bill. Is that correct? It, it is, and I think what I mentioned uh, at my presentation uh, several weeks ago, we're still workshopping some of this, and in fact, I was hopeful we would come back later in September. Um, we're working on some uh, software coding uh, to take care of that right now because, I mean, even today I received a complaint where something had been alleged to be still open in, in, uh, uh, in the app. Um, it was, so I always tell people with certainty, we get out there. Um, we don't have the automated way of closing it. We have to go in and manually close that, so we're doing that periodically. But with this software fix, which we've been asking for for a while, and which I think will be getting delivered here shortly, um, this will uh, integrate both BSNA with City Work, City Source, um, and it will close that loop. So when we are closing things in BSNA, when we are finally saying, "Yep, green thumbs up, this was taken care of," that will automatically feed back over um, to the resident. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, I, I appreciate what you just said, Brian, about the integration. But I, just, I still just find that um, what you just said, although helpful, I still find it a little fantastic that, you know, closed means three different things um, in, in, a, in a computer um, program that's supposed to be, um, you know, providing a service to our Lansing residents. So how are they supposed to know that closed could mean one of three different things um, if, you know, if when they're, when they're doing this. And so for me, you know, it, it's not working well. Uh, you said it was, it's, it's not working well. It's not working well because it's not being responsive and it's not providing us the information. And so I, I reiterate what we said when, when Mr. McGrain was here a few weeks ago. Um, we need to simplify the language then. There has to be pending, closed, maybe, I don't know. But to say, you know, it's working well, it's not. And, and, and the, the reason to me, there's three good reasons here why it's not working well because you've got three different definitions of what it means for something to be closed um, because it depends on you know, which department it's in. And, and so you know, I, I'm hoping that the fix that Brian's talking about makes us a little bit more responsive to our, to our citizens that way. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yes, Mr. Brumby. I'll agree. Uh, more than in part, um, that there's another that there is another element in play, and that is the human interaction on our end, uh, where um, I said it's mostly working in that uh, I believe most of the things that are reported do get taken care of. Where we fall down oftentimes is that communication back to the resident that isn't always automatic, and I agree 100% that we can certainly do a better job there in one automating whenever we can what we did so that they know. Sometimes it's added to a project that won't kick off for months or next year, and sometimes it is uh, a, a different response. And I agree that we can certainly improve the communication back to residents, and they want and deserve that. And in fact, uh, we're um, evaluating all of the not yet closed Lansing Connect requests now and categorizing them in um, why aren't they closed? And, and we have some that are years old, not a surprise to you, right? Um, years old that, um, that we have taken care of, and we have some that are years old that are part of an upcoming project, but we didn't communicate that back to folks. And then we have some that have honestly slipped through the cracks. And part of uh, finding the fix 
programmatically is to, uh, is to fix the people part too. We can program everything, but there's a, a people part where we have to respond back to folks and, and there's a little manual work in that too, but I think both of us agree that our departments uh, can do a better job there. So I, I agree with almost everything you say um, about it's not working the way we want it to. Thank you. May I add on to that, please? Um, so what Mr. Mumby said, too, is absolutely correct in my department. I think once we get the software fix, and, and literally this is integrating programs in, so we have some automation flow, it is going to require retraining. And I think that's a step we haven't gone to at this point, because if it's not working right, I don't want to train people in something that's wrong. So once we get it in, and we've been promised within the next couple of weeks, um, we'll be able to do some training to basically say, this is, you know, when you get this, this is how you're going to respond, and then everything should work right. But for us, literally, it's going to be taking one piece of code and dropping it into BSNA, and then that should integrate the two. And in looking at your responses here for closed, you have three actually um, comments here, and I think the last one has to do with duplication of request, and um, that also becomes problematic because you have a neighborhood that everyone might be responding to it and putting in a request to have that pothole fixed, we'll say, in the middle of the block. And the one person that might have been the first person to put it in shows it open and the rest of them show it, it appears would be closed here because it's a duplication and they're all still looking at a pothole that needs to be filled. There's one more neat uh, improvement, enhancement to the program that is coming, and it is the uh, duplication detector. I don't know what the official name is, but um, if it um, finds that there is a similar uh, request or complaint in the area, what it does is say, uh, I think you might be talking about this, and it shows a picture that maybe the other person reported. Is this the same complaint that you are reporting to us today? If it is, the program will automatically lump those together and all communications about that will go to everyone who reported it. That's an enhancement we don't have today, uh, but an enhancement that they have said is coming soon. Um, so we think that will help, but you're correct. If seven people put it in, um, again, our, the people resource that has to respond to all these uh, do not 100% communicate with all seven like they should. Soon we hope they won't have to manually, but it will be automatic. If you insist, no, this is a different pothole, that one is six inches away, and we have another pothole here, it will let you put in your, your new request, but it will ask you if maybe, maybe you're talking about the same issue, and it will automatically lump those together. So we're hoping that will help as well. Okay, I, I think my question then would be, I, and I know it's further on in your explanation, you talk about what the cost is um, for this, is this an additional cost that we're going to be charged to have this um, on, or is this something that should have been integrated when it first came, when we first purchased it, or what? There are no uh, further charges for these enhancements. Uh, some of them are just the newest version of the software and uh, the other is just uh, having the various uh, companies work together and our support with um, City Sourced, Rock Salad, that company which is Lansing Connect, and with BSNA, those folks are working together and they're not charging us anything above uh, uh, hours that we already have in our contract. So there won't be any additional charges besides our staff time working with them to tell them what we need. Okay. Do you wanna go on with the memo? Uh, sure. Um, well, a lot, a lot more of them are also similar. Once you get through those three uh, examples, then we, we talk about some other specific um, issues. And one is uh, solid waste requests, um, various reasons they could be closed. Um, it could be that uh, someone said the recycling wasn't picked up, but it was actually not their, their week for recycling to be picked up, and so that would be closed. Again, we should comment back to them why we closed it, not just close it. Um, we talk further about, try not to give you every single word in detail. Um, they, it could be closed due to not being a City of Lansing issue or it's outside of um, our um, city service area. 
folks um, oftentimes will report something, they can't geographically report something out of the city, the map prohibits them from doing that, but they might report right on the edge of the city and they're talking about something outside the city, that's another reason it could be closed, not that often. Um, I think that's really the, the rest of the um, different reasons they could be closed. The next part of the explanation talks about um, how folks can check the status of their um, Lansing Connect uh, report. Um, this is, I'm reading, I'm reading your uh, questions and then looking for my answer, sorry. Um, I guess the next question that I think came from this group is does it mean a letter is sent when an issue is closed? How can a citizen tell whether an issue is resolved? So I'm kind of on the third, the third page here. Mm -hmm. um, and it really, I think it depends on, on the issue. Certainly Lansing Connect, every kind of issue doesn't result in a, a letter being um, issued to folks. Uh, there are certain processes that require written notification, uh, particularly in, in code. Um, but those don't go through Lansing Connect. They, they interface with, with other software. Um, and again, the folks that uh, initially report their, the, the problem do not get notified. They don't get a letter also. Um, there are some privacy reasons why we don't necessarily um, tell them where the, what the status is of the, of the complaint if it's a code issue. Um, however, if there is a written notification that's part of our our code um, response, we, we do that for the Lansing Connect ones as well. Should I just keep going until? Yeah. Th okay. Um, Unless somebody raises <coughs> their hand, okay, you're great. good. Uh, question from Council Member Dunbar about a before and after photo option. Is that possible? Uh, absolutely, it's possible. And we do that in, um, in some cases with, um, with Lansing Connect and certainly with City Works, uh, in particular, Sidewalk Snow, you're all familiar with. Uh, we take before and after photos there. It's certainly uh, possible. It's not necessarily practical with things like potholes, uh, premise violations. Uh, Brian, your group does that. Um, generally don't do them for uh, tall grass violations. Certainly could take uh, more time and resources if we did, and Brian sure. can say more. Yep, and, and certainly thank you, uh, council members, for your suggestions throughout the, the past year and a half. We are doing more with documentation, particularly with trash. Uh, we're certainly doing the before and the after pictures and our contractors to, in fact, before they're paid, have to um, submit photos of their empty truck and their full truck. Um, grass, we're not doing it. I mean, we write thousands of grass, but where, where we do do it is when we dispatch the contractor. We figure at that point, grass grows up when they're out and they're mowing it, there's the tall grass. So um, we don't take a picture at the beginning of that, but for basically everything else at this point, we are taking a picture and including that with our documentation. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, you said it's not practical to take a before and after picture of a pothole. Can you um, expand on that, please? Uh, sure. Um, with the current condition of our streets, um, our, a typical response to potholes would be to patrol an entire, we, we'll do a block or a region, we'll send a pothole patrol out and they will uh, find all of the potholes that are maybe within six or eight blocks and then they will go through and, and patch every one of them and they bulk all those requests together into a single work order. Um, they could um, probably have a crew member step out of the cab and, and try to take a photo of, of each one as they did them but they wouldn't necessarily tie back to each individual Lansing Connect request. While they'll all get closed, when we close the big work order, the photos would, it, it, we might have 60 or 80 photos on that big work order. Uh, it's not impossible, it would take uh, more time and we probably would have to change how we respond. Something like a rough road request, if we went out to a particular street and maybe uh, skin patched or did a more substantial repair to a block, I would think that would be pretty uh, practical and and reasonable to, to do that, to take a before and after photo. And certainly we do that a lot with uh, construction projects. Um, we, could, we could do it. I just don't believe it would be practical to do with every pothole. Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. <coughs> I, I appreciate that answer. I was wondering about that. But if 50 people call in on the same pothole, you can't sit there and post the photo to 50 different complaints. But that begs the question, if, if somebody were to call in a stretch like if there was uh, 
an address. They're asked to put in like the nearest address. Could it somehow be programmed to self-populate? Like, are you referring to this one that's already been submitted? And it would just be a duplicate and then you can respond to all of the people that have clicked in on that one with one photo. Uh, the, the answer to the first part um, was what I was referring to earlier was the, the upcoming enhancement should um, suggest that perhaps the complaint's already been entered and asked if it's the same one and then bundle them. And then as far as the response, um, is it possible for us to? Uh, absolutely, it's possible. I'm not sure it's practical, but it, um, it's possible, yes. Sorry, do all of your folks carry a city cell? Uh, they do not, but every crew has um, some kind of electronic device tied into our system. So those that don't have a city cell phone have an iPad or some other device so that they're getting their work real time and they can report what they're doing real time. Okay, they have something that could Something that could take photo and a photo. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, the next question I have here is uh, cost uh, for CityWorks, I believe. And uh, the, the price has, I don't think it has substantially changed since the beginning. Uh, it's not cheap. Uh, but uh, $34,800 is the approximate cost. I don't know if that's rounded a little bit. Um, and the other part of the question, I think, was was the contractor on site when we implemented it? They were not. Um, we had multiple uh, Skype kind of meetings, and we had <coughs> our staff uh, on site, all the folks that interacted with, but uh, the folks from um, City Sourced were not here in the office. Okay, on, on the cost, the 34,800, is that um, per year for the licensing and, and the work that's being done? Was there an upcharge to initially start the, the program? Are you aware of? I don't recall, I could c confirm. Um, if you there, could there confirm There probably that. was a small, uh, well, not, nothing small, these are no. thousands of dollars. There probably was a charge to start, and yes, I can get the answer back. Okay, if you can get the answer back. And how long have we had um, City at Lansing Connects now? I should have prepared for this one. Uh, more than three years, I think. Around maybe three-ish years. Can I give you that answer along with the? Yes. I'll be happy to. Thank you. The last question I think had to do with uh, with other categories from yes. Councilmember Hussein. Councilmember Hussein's question. Um, and the response is. Uh, we need to ask Councilmember Hussein for examples of what would fit in the other category. These came directly from staff, so I apologize. Uh, currently, we have the following categories submitted, received, in process, on hold, referred to department, could not verify, closed, and not an issue, and canceled. Um, and then the end, the end of the response is, does uh, his request refer to types of problems citizens should be able to report that are not, that currently don't fit one of the general problem categories, or are you, are you suggesting another status? So maybe we didn't understand yeah, So the question much. pertained to issue type, okay. um, and I gave the example, I think, uh, that night, um, the, the ordinance uh, against uh, window signage that exceeds 20% uh, coverage along our commercial corridors and districts. Uh, and, and so there are a number of issues, even, even I, uh, as somebody that wants to participate and engage with Lansing Connect, um, there's a number of things that aren't in there. And so I was actually involved in an email exchange uh, between Samar Morgan, Jason Wilkes, uh, current leadership of the Public Service Committee, as well as Andrew, uh, Andrew Kilpatrick, uh, pertaining to, to this very issue. Um, and it was uh, conveyed that we don't want the, the site to be overwhelming uh, for individuals that get on and, and having to scroll page after page after page of issue type. But my concern is that I have to then basically make my best guess as to what the closest, I closest issue type is. We hope that that is then relayed to the correct person. And if it's not the correct person, we hope that the issue is then relayed to the correct person, but we certainly don't know on our end if it is. So could we create another category and then have somebody that can onboard those issues that is responsible or responsible for relaying it to the appropriate person? That was the question. And, and I believe that that email exchange all was talking about the carts at the at the streets, the, re the recycling and the garbage carts, which are not listed as one of those complaint items in there in Lansing Connect. So the short answer is 
yes, we, we can uh, modify what the problem types are that it will uh, take in, and we could add an other, that would certainly add a human element where someone would have to um, for sure go through those and assign each one of those to a type. There, I don't know that we'd be able to do any automation with that. Um, one cool thing, uh, Madam President, about the upgrade that'll take care of the duplicates to some extent too, is they're telling us that we will have the ability to add and remove um, problem types at our level and not have to request uh, someone in California to do that for us in an upcoming build we'll be able to turn uh, items on and off and add and subtract. Um, now that does create some uh, potential for problems if we want them to interact with another program and we haven't set up that interaction, uh, but they're gonna give us some more flexibility um, to do some of those things ourselves in this new version. But the short answer is we could, yes, it would take some more human element and people labor to assign them properly, but we could do that. I, I do, sure, thank you, uh, Councilman. Thank you, too, for, for noting that. Uh, you know, at some point you have like 300 drop downs, and that's just unmanageable, too. But actually, the thing that uh, worries me more is quite often these sort of co occurring situations. Uh, just last week, I got a complaint. It was about uh, six people being on a lease when they thought there were only two people in the house, and there was a car on the lawn and unraked leaves, and they were smoking marijuana. Um, I guess all bad, but when you parcel that out, some of that we can do nothing about. Some of it involves the landlord. In this case, it was the, the Lansing Housing Commission. So sometimes it does, again, take that human element to actually sort out what's going on. And I think we actually do a really good job at figuring out, okay, maybe this is building safety, that's code, and maybe this involves a third party too. So these cases oftentimes are actually more complex than figuring out the right drop down. Okay. Council Member Washington. Um, Chris, I know you have to leave, and I don't want you to leave without me saying this. Thank you so much for not dancing around this, for being very forthright about the inefficiencies and just admitting they are there and that there are things that will be done about it. I, I really appreciate that. No problem. It's true. Any other questions for Mr. Kilpatrick? Or Mr. K I'm sorry. He's next. I know. <laughs> Mr. Mumby. No questions? All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And then we'll take Andy. Mr. Kilpatrick, uh, we have a grant uh, that we're going to be discussing. And uh, the reason this did not go to Ways and Means is it is a timing um, issue and actually has to be signed on the 12th or 13th, I believe. So uh, this is why it's before council at this point. Sir. Madam President and council members, thanks for getting this on more quickly. Um, as was mentioned, we only found out about this last week of the timing. Apparently the state says that because this is switching fiscal years, by the 13th it has to go in for whatever system they have to carry forward the money to the next fiscal year. We thought we needed it by the end of, of this month, end of September, and then the timing would have worked fine. But because of that, um, we needed to move it up more quickly so that we could get it done in advance. Um, so briefly, this is a new program through EGLE, formerly DEQ, so recycling grant. Um, the maximum amount was $500,000. We in, jointly with East Lansing, we were the kind of, we're the fiduciary for this grant, but we applied basically for one recycling truck for the city of Lansing, one for East Lansing, so we're splitting it 240000 each. If you look in the grant form, you can see that East Lansing's match is a little higher. That's because the truck that they picked is more expensive than the one we picked. Um, but this will be on a reimbursement basis, so East Lansing doesn't get their money before they return. They turn receipts into us. We send them to the state. We get the reimbursement and then pass that back on to to East Lansing. And that's pretty much kind of the brief summary of, of what we have here. And I'm can answer questions. Andy. Um, Council Member Spadafore, go ahead. Mr. Kilpatrick, um, is this a, um, are you replacing a truck or is this an, an, a new one added to the fleet? These are replacing trucks, okay. so we're not adding trucks. Um, we have trucks that are, and I don't have the list of exactly the age and, and number of miles, but a lot of them are really past what the replacement cycle are, so, so this, this is helping us be able to kind of modernize our fleet. Okay, thanks. And. Uh, my question would be our share, are the, is there a match? So there is, there's no technical match. 
but it's it's capped at two hundred and forty thousand dollars for the truck. So we are anticipating. I believe ours was like ninety three thousand. Um, I see ninety three thousand. Yeah, six one six. So yes, um, and East Lansing's a little higher because the the model of truck or the brand that they picked was more expensive than ours. So if, if we could find a recycling truck for two hundred forty thousand dollars, then we would have no match. But because of what the, the cap is in the grant, um, then yes, there is essentially a match on that. Okay. And even though East Lansing picked a different truck, can you give us any issues as to why they picked their truck, the, the one that they picked? Because we're taking their recycling. So it's just a matter of them picking it up. Correct. It is um, so. Basically, these are the same trucks that we have for our trash and recycling. We have the same kind of brand. Um, so we pick the the one we're most familiar with. They, for whatever reason, picked a, a different type, just like a Ford or a Chevy. Um, so our preference okay. is to keep with what we're familiar with. So the mechanics are familiar with exactly what we're we're working on. Um, but they do the same thing. Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Vice President Spadafore. I move. Sorry. I move the resolution. Yeah, there's a resolution. I move the resolution for accepting the grant for $480,000 from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy. All right, we have a motion um, to accept the grant. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passed unanimously, and this is on the agenda for. Uh, tonight for passage. Uh, thank you very much. So with that, we will now move into our presentation by Mr. McGrain and Mr. Tersice and his team on economic development and planning update. Well, it looks a little bit different now. Um, well, thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, uh, council members for inviting us here tonight to speak to the city's ongoing economic development efforts. I think this actually came out of our trash conversation from a few weeks ago. So yes, it did. happy to come back and talk about some of the more, more fun stuff. Not that trash isn't exciting, but uh, I think some of the economic development things we have going on are, are pretty darn cool too. So uh, as you all, of course, know, Mayor Shore's, Mayor Shore's first executive order in office was to restructure and create the Department of Economic Development and Planning which I now direct. Um, many divisions remained in EDP, planning, zoning, building safety, parking, and code enforcement was of course added. Um, additionally, a heightened relationship was established between EDP and LEPFA, and also with LEAP, which continues to manage Lansing's Economic Development Corporation on behalf of the city. Um, I'm joined here tonight by Bob Trezice, and I think when I turn things over to you in a few minutes, I'll have him introduce the remainder of his team. Um, the two of us will, uh, the two of us, the five of us, uh, we'll cover a variety of economic development topics as we continue to share fruitful relationship as LEAP provides our primary economic development staffing for the city. Um, just wanted to touch on a couple of divisional highlights, um, just again to remind you of all the, the other things going on in EDP. Code enforcement, we've spoken extensively about that uh, tonight and, and in other meetings. Um, just want you to be aware again that we are writing thousands of violation notices um, each month as well as visiting hundreds of housing units. And housing, of course, is a predominant feature of that division and certainly thinking about our housing stock is something important to the economic uh, status of our region. Building safety, we've been super, super busy. Um, just to let you know, last fiscal year we brought in our projected annual income in May, a full two months ahead of, of uh, the end of the fiscal year. Our activity indicators on permitting are significantly exceeding expectations already this year. And just wanted to let you know that our folks are doing everything from reviewing plans for McLaren, to walking and inspecting the new Provident Place building, to checking in on Mr. Latoski's carport, to signing off on Ms. Wong's uh, uh, salon. So certainly they're busy from all things big and small, and we know that uh, a salon opening can be just as important as the ribbon cutting on a large new hospital uh, to the person who's opening. Uh, in parking, uh, we continue on with our extreme parking makeover. Lots of physical improvements have been taking place in our lots and our garages, and we're working hard on deployment of our new machines, new entry and exit gates at ramps and lots, um, but also on the new payment stations downtown and soon that long-awaited app. 
Planning and zoning, our staff continues to manage requests going through planning board, zoning board, and historic district commission, as well as handling day-to-day -day requests for their support. Um, all site plans continue to come through this office, and I'm delighted to let you all know that just late last week, the fully engineered site plans for the Red Cedar development came into our office. Um, that alone is going to keep us busy for, for a few weeks. Um, finally, in our development office, uh, we're working diligently to expend all of our federal resources, which go to support a wide variety of pr improvements across the city. Most specifically, we have a great deal of resources aimed at upgrading housing throughout the city for homeowners and renters alike. Um, with that, let me turn things over to Bob. Bob is going to dive deeper into our economic development uh, efforts, uh, a rundown on our activities, and I think probably also introduce us to his staff. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, and thank you to the City Council and to Mayor Shore. Samantha for supporting our continued economic development efforts. The city is going very well, a lot of triumphs, and um, we're very pleased to always leap is to have a contract with the city and continue on with our great work. Hannah Bryant is, um, is primarily working now on facade program and corridor improvement. I would say this is a centerpiece probably to Mayor Shore's economic development efforts and I think it's going very well, and we'll hear from Hannah in a minute about some statistics that's happening there. Chris Klein works a lot of our projects across the city of Lansing. He is currently working on Lake Trust. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but Chris, thank you for all your hard work across the city. And then we have our Vice President of Economic Development, Carl Dorshimer, who is in charge of the city of Lansing contract and all of our economic development efforts at LEAP. So I'll hit in a few points and then we'll dive in even deeper with the individual staff. As I said, uh, our facade program, your facade program has been a huge success. If you recall the first couple of years when we approved a small amount and then a larger amount, we talked a lot about our struggles to properly market, get the word out and get people participating. Of course, there's always that internal, it's like everything in life, I guess, complicated to put together a good, competent program, make sure you get the money out quickly and in the right way. And um, we went through a learning curve in the first year, but we still did a very good job in that first year. There, there wasn't anything wrong, but it really kicked in um, this year big time. Uh, we, while we've done marketing, we really haven't had to. The word is out on the street, the evidence. And this is exactly what I think we want to buy a facade program is people's neighbors have seen an upgrade of their storefronts next door or across the street, and then there's pressure building for them to do it, or they just want to do it. They want to meet those new standards themselves. So uh, we've had a lot of applications this year already. I think we've basically maybe approaching to spending almost basically the entirety of the money already. So uh, that's going on. And then you add on an organizational structure on top of that. The corridor improvement authorities, you're well underway, and thank you to actually approving now the tax increment finance. As a reminder to the public and anyone out there, these are not tax increases. These are not taxes. It's a capture of current taxes, or I should say the new um, taxes that will be generated from investment in those corridors. And that's on Michigan Avenue and West Saginaw. And then we're adding, um, you're working on right now, the construction organizationally of facade improvement programs on North Grand River, basically the airport into downtown, and then also for South Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. So we're gonna have four corridor improvement authorities. You get an organizational structure. I always think- Bob, before you yes. go further, yes. I, I just wanted to go back to the facades before. Mm -hmm. And if people have questions as he's going over here, over these, um, we will probably stop you and ask that. Yeah, please do. Um, I, I do know that one of the concerns that came up with um, uh, the facades was, um, and it, the applicant was 1910 Meat Market, and um, the problems that that particular owner had had. Um, the issues that we, that, that it had happened was that, you know, you guys have Approved it. You, the site plan was approved. All of those things that went through the zoning um, office and the building safety office and all of those things. And then um, when they went out for um, the approval of their lighting, uh, the approval of their lighting, it was the contractors that told them that 
um, that, that, that the approvals that you'd already gotten from the city did not meet city code. So I'm, I'm trying to yep. understand, and, and we all received an email um, from the uh, property owner with some of the concerns um, with that. So how are we maneuvering those types of hiccups? Right, well, I think uh, the most important distinction to make is that that particular issue is not this facade program. And that facade program that is working someone else jump in but that was actually utilizing the city cdbg money okay and this money for this facade program is beautiful because it's our money and we can make the rules and structure it together cdbg is driven by i mean a, you know a very thick booklet of rules and regulations from the federal government and uh, uh so i want to make that one statement that that particular facade is different from this facade program that we're talking about. Tonight. Okay, and and but I'll get to the I, okay. But I'll still explain but, what but, happened. There. But the issue is, no matter what pot of money it came from, you had a group approving plans and site plans, and the uh, owner moved forward based on those to have the people doing the work say that that didn't meet the city's ordinances. Brian, I'm going to have to... Uh, sure, and, and, and I would jump in to say we've corrected those issues. I mean, I would point one figure to say this was a different pot of money. It was actually also a much more substantial project than I think our traditional um, facade. But either way, I would let you know that some of those issues have been corrected. We took care of those issues internally, and I don't think there was anything that he wanted to do um, that we've disallowed. I think we were able to work through those situations and um, hopefully correct those issues for the future. Councilmember Zane, did you want to jump in? Um, it, it was a CDBG, obviously, effort, and it, it was substantial. It was a $60,000 um, project. Uh, the, you know, the issue is, and, and I'm glad that, you know, we're able to use that to fix some issues on our end to make sure that doesn't happen again. But when you talk about um, a business, uh, you know, a project um, that was delayed several months, um, several people in the area thought, to be quite frank, um, you know, during certain stages the, the store was closed. Uh, you're looking at 30 to 40 percent of your monthlies uh, in terms of a decrease. That's the death knell for a small business. Um, so inefficiencies and, and issues on our end could have cost this person his business. Um, so I just want to make sure that we, we never lose the importance, the urgency, and making sure we correct those things on our end uh, because we certainly don't want reputable businesses uh, like 1910 um, to, to go under. Uh, I did have one follow-up question, if that's okay. Uh, in terms of the facade project, are we doing anything to uh, ensure dispersion across the city so that we don't have $165,000 being plunked into one part of the city? Um, no, we definitely are. Um, and this, actually, this year it's open to the downtown. Um, so last round it was not open. But we actually have a map um, that kind of shows how wide it is and where exactly it's covering. Um, and even this year with pre-applications, it's all over Lansing, South Lansing, North Bend River, um, on Michigan Ave. So it is a wide variety for sure. Councilmember uh, Spitzley, then Councilmember Washington. Were, were you done, Councilmember Hussein? I, I think Councilmember Washington. Okay, and then Councilmember um, Garzas. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. I am um, both happy and somewhat disturbed by you saying that the facade grants are now open to folks downtown. Oh, and let me tell you why. Because um, we have a, a small business that's right down there on Larch, it's a tire company there, that's been trying for a couple years to get um, a facade grant and have been told each time that they're just inside downtown and so they're not eligible. And now you're telling me that you're going to expand it to downtown. Have you reached out to folks downtown to let them know this? We have spoke with um, the downtown. Um, Inc. Lansing Inc. Thank you, CLI. And um, we have spoke with them and kind of gave them all the information. Um, and they were going to um, start reaching out even further. We've reached out to a couple, and we've received several applications from downtown. When's, so the, when's the deadline? The deadline, we have, it's first come, first serve. Um, but 
it is when the menu February, is gone, it's gone. It's like till February. Yeah. Well, because I, you know, I certainly a, want my this these this this small business owner. I mean, he's he's right by where um, Pat Gillespie's doing his great, you know, his 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 stuff, and and everything's you know growing up and doing well around him. And and this this small business would like to you know be eligible for some fa facade grants. And so I, what I need, you know, if you're telling me it's a rolling thing. I need to, you know, reach out to them tomorrow and tell them to apply immediately then. Right, and I am more than happy to also take their information as well and yeah. reach out to them and go through the process with them. So. Okay, yeah. thank you. Councilmember Washington and then Councilmember Garza. Thank you, Madam President. Um, got a little bit of a problem with downtown being opened up to this. Uh, we hear it over and over and over again. Everything goes downtown. And now that this is open up to downtown, and I actually had this conversation during the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority because the first thing they jumped on is and we can get facade grants. This is taking more and more money. We're trying to better the entire city. And this was meant for off Michigan Avenue, for off downtown, because they get so many other things that I'm I'm a little concerned about this. I have a lot of small businesses throughout the city, and if this now is going to be able to go to downtown, um, I, I just have a little bit of a problem with it. And um, I, it was truly initially meant for small business outside of the downtown area. If I may, um, I, I think we'll be able to get you. Do we have copies of the map right now for disbursement or will those? Um, so I think we're actually rather proud of where these uh, grants have gone. And I can tell you it's still the administration's uh, standpoint that these will be spread out throughout town. And not only that, I think we're interested in the diversity of business owners who are able to participate in this program. So um, while I don't think we share the same concern, we certainly are interested in seeing these grants being dispersed across the community. And I think we've been rather pleased with, with where they've been and where I hope they continue to go. But if they're first come, first serve, how are you telling some that they're well, not going to if this whole group is the first people here? Yeah. And we know downtown is going to jump on it. So a couple things that might be helpful. I appreciate the comments. Um, it, without question, our office understands the spirit of, of the budget. And I think there was a conversation during the budget process about this. I could be wrong, but. So I, I want to assure you that we really understand and share the, the spirit of the, the appropriation, which is for the corridors primarily outside of the downtown. In this budget appropriation or the language of the resolution, it did specifically allow this year, Hannah, you're gonna have to help me, but I think it was $25,000 uh, as a ratio in comparison to 160. 165,000 overall for the rest of the corridors. So um, I hear what you're saying, and I guess I'm hoping that that reassures you that we've got this right, we understand the spirit, we agree with the spirit of uh, why the money was appropriated, and we did as an administration think that um, just taking really honestly a, a quite a very small amount of money from it and applying it to downtown because perhaps the pendulum has swung too far um, a downtown, which is where a lot of, if not most of the primary historic structures are that more typically use facade program, there is no facade program at all for downtown. And I don't think that's right either, and, and maybe not what we all want. So we hope that we got a nice ratio that, that you know, gives a little bit to downtown and the vast majority of it to the outlying corridor areas. Councilmember Garza. Thank you, Madam President. So is this a map of everybody that's applied so far, or these are the ones that? Sorry. That is actually from last year, last 2008, year, okay. yeah. OK, so um, how much money of that 165,000 is left? So last year was 150, and we've used it um, completely for last year. Um, right now, we haven't um, rewarded any grants for this upcoming round. Um, we've received about over, well, over 25 applications. Um, but we have not rewarded anything else for this upcoming program. So out of, let's say, 25 applications and you do a first come, first serve, would that pretty much eat up the 165? Probably. Yeah. So, um, so people that apply 
from now until February, most likely they won't get approved for this year. Uh, that's how popular, I mean, this, this, these are good problems, uh, but probably, yes. Okay, and can you tell me if there's any uh, application, applicants from Southeast Lansing, Ward 2 specifically? Um, I'm trying to think, there's, I think so, yes, actually. There's been a couple. Okay, from if you could, could you possibly, you know, follow up and send me the addresses of those? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Absolutely. And the, the, pop, the program's popular. I, I really congratulate you and Mayor Shore for really hitting uh, a, a, a great spot in the city that obviously people really care about. I mean, it's really caught on. It's obviously needed, and the program is loved. So is this something that's going to be continued? Do you it's know? up to you. Okay, okay, well, okay, for, okay, I guess my question is, I should have asked is, what do we tell the people that want to? Because I've been, you know, preaching to the choir as far as my, uh, small business owners in, uh, in Southeast Lansing. Um, I don't really want to get them discouraged, but I mean, should I tell them that maybe hold off till next year or? No. Or, okay, so. No, right now. Okay, so yes. they, they sign up. Let's say they run out of money out of the 25 applicants that's already applied. Do they get put first in line if this gets approved for next year? Or do um, they maybe, to submit again? Uh, you know, again, good problem to have. We hadn't considered it to be fo before, to be honest with you, but now perhaps we're gonna have to think about some things like that. Maybe we're gonna have to put slightly more stringent criteria in place as well. I don't know. But again, these are all good problems. Maybe you wanna consider the dollar amount again. I, you know, that's uh, even another possibility, but these are all good things and um, the demand is high. Uh, but I, I think right now we should just take it one step at a time. I encourage, there's plenty, of, anyone right now should continue to apply as we sort through. We haven't come anywhere close to making choices or uh, getting to that spot yet. Yep. Thank okay, you. I have Council <coughs> Member Spitzley, Washington, and Spadafore. Thanks, Madam President. I did have a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I heard Spitzley, <laughs> Washington, and Spadafore. <laughs> I yield my time to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Madam President and Vice President Spadafor. Um, so uh, notwithstanding um, the difference of opinion about up here about downtown versus not downtown, I, I, I'm still, um, you know, as I look on the list and look at the, the folks, is, is, is there a, I, I need to know the criteria of what's considered a small business is more Foster Inc. a small business? And no, no, you know, disrespect to them, but they're a large insurance company. Are they a small business? Um, but I, you know, and some of the others, Reach Art Studio, are they a small business? Are they a nonprofit? So what's, what's, what's the criteria? And I'm gonna get back to this thing like, you know, I asked you specifically, you know, or at least I thought I did, was there still funding available and you encouraged for this, for my small business here, you said yes, encourage, and then I'm pretty if sure I heard, I'm pretty sure I heard that there's probably not gonna be money based on If we approved all the, 25 today, it'd be gone. Uh, so the dollar amount is about there, but we haven't approved all 25 yet. We're still really just in the opening stages of, of taking a look at all the applications, so there's still time for further to apply. Well, I mean, guys, it's hard for me to concentrate. Thank you. Uh, it's, I mean, I would, again, in reflection, the first you know, year that we put this together, uh, or year, or a couple years, we struggled to get applicants. I mean, our main concern really was trying to get applicants. That was our whole first year was a marketing struggle. We had few applicants. We were taking everybody. And um, so I'm just being straightforward with you that I think the program has evolved very rapidly and sort of matured, which is, again, great problems to have. So I don't think you're incorrect at all that, um, I don't think we can do it now, but after this year, and if you were to appropriate monies again, that we're gonna have to appropriate, I'm sorry, uh, you know, put different kinds of criteria in. But I, again, I'm just being very straightforward with you. We took anybody because we were not having the correct demand, especially in the first year. Yep. Councilmember Washington, then Councilmember Spadafore. Um, 
Thank you, Madam President. Bob, I was wondering if when you give Jeremy his list and his word, if you could maybe just give all of us an entire list. We will. We'll give everybody an entire list. I, I don't know why we wouldn't. Um, Thank you. We, and, we, and I will put, be. I just want to, um, you know, we, we, like any good staff, we, we evaluate all the projects based on. Absolutely. We think the merit and the quality of the projects and try to help everybody out by um, sticking to those standards. We do have an excellent committee, by the way. We, we don't make the final decisions. We have a committee of, of experts on facades. Right. And, and I wanted to mention that too and thank them for their volunteer service to the city, their architects and so forth. And to Councilwoman Spitzley, I really believe when we went downtown, we more specifically meant Michigan Avenue because that's where all the attention has been, but it became downtown. And I think w the initial intent was Michigan Avenue. Let's not do Michigan Avenue because it's taking on energy of its own. There's a lot of investment there and we wanted to spread it out. Um, and Bob, you don't take enough credit. I think that this um, brainchild actually came between Councilman Hussein and yourself. You two actually worked it out and I think this, you I should think it was be Mayor Shore and all of you. Well, this happened before <laughs> Mayor Shore came on board. This. This was while Virgin well, was kind, here, so it was you and Adam, but yeah. really kudos. It's a great program. Yeah. Thank you. Council Member Spadafore, Vice President Spadafore, thank you. For real this time? Yes, okay. for real. Good. Um, thank you all for being here. This is really nice to hear uh, all, the, all the other stuff too, but I want to focus in on the facade program for just a minute too. Um, I did check our budget resolutions. There was no change in the, the criteria for where these dollars went. And I remember the first year, this was an exhaustive process that involved bringing back the requirements to city council to take a look at. I don't know right. if they approved them or not. And during that time, we also brought up the fact of what if we run out of money? Can we do the rolling application type situation? And that was a change we did request in the application, not including downtown. So I'm wondering what the application process is, how, the, how that those criteria are determined absent what was clearly the sort of the understanding around this table for the last two budget cycles? I, I want to. I'm just trying to make sure I understand the question that you're saying in the. Who budget. made the decision to change the criteria for the those? Because it was not in the budget. The administration. Okay. Council members. I appreciate the clarification because it was back in fiscal year 2018 that we argued for this project. As a matter of fact, um, I knew at the time that it was going to be incredibly successful once we figured out the marketing piece of it. Um, and I think what we tried to do uh, originally was push forward $250,000. That was slowly whittled away uh, through the budget process down to $15,000 and we celebrated that uh, because it kind of created a, um, a placement uh, holder, if you will. Uh, and then it gave us an opportunity to almost treat it as a pilot. And then hopefully, um, you know, we had found some success and we'd be able to, uh, to argue that that success means or meant that we should, um, that we should prioritize and fund it at a higher level. Um, we were very explicit. It wasn't um, about spirit. It wasn't about, it was, we were explicit that yes, we wanted this money actual language. outside of the downtown area. Uh, because there are a number of tools uh, in the toolbox for, for downtown economic development. Whether it be, you know, the fact that the TIFA is, is downtown, whether it be that we do have core or improvement authorities in place that are um, actually empowered as, as TIFs. Um, oh, wow. Whether it be state statute, state statute puts more tools in the toolbox, in my opinion, um, to promote economic development downtown than it does outside of the downtown area. So um, that was the explicit purpose of this grant. So I'm a little bit um, upset that um, anybody uh, um, you know, kind of unilaterally went forward and, and made that decision without some, some conversation. Um, that, that's, that's concerning to me. But with that being said, um, one of my concerns in terms of technical support, and this was actually uh, an issue the first year, do we do anything when we, when we deny somebody's application, do we do anything, you're talking about small business owners, I'm thinking mm -hmm. as an example, uh, Eric Cycling on South MLK. Uh, they have applied twice, I don't know why um, they were denied, uh, but some of these small business owners are trying to navigate what is a pretty complex process, um, and, and their applications certainly have merit, but they weren't able to check the box on something, they didn't know how to check the box on something, do we do anything to kind of make sure they understand why they were denied, what they could potentially do the next time around to be more successful? Is there, do we have meetings where we bring them in and, and coach them up? What do, what do we do to support? Well, I personally, I have not been through that end of the project, but I'm definitely, like, 
we usually um, will explain why, like we'll follow up with them, explain the reason, but also um, even the beginning stages, I've sat down with multiple people just to go through the beginning process of it, the application. You know, there are um, things that are required that we have to supply and sometimes um, just us sitting down and having that initial conversation helps, but um, I think maybe um, on the latter side of it as well, sitting down and going through that process. And the um, committee's been excellent too. Right. Those are real experts, architects and so forth, and they have been very proactive with a uh, number of folks who, because I agree with you, I think it is complicated. I mean, it's serious engineering, you know, and, and you want to get it right uh, for the code and safety reasons and everything else, aesthetics as well. And so we have had a good set of experts. If you recall, we tried to even take different chunks of money, and if someone wasn't ready, could they use small amounts of money for technical Correct. assistance? Hire, yeah, which was all a good idea, except suddenly when we put all that in place with kind of low demand initially and, and trying to, again, I would say somewhat of a learning curve, which I think is okay, but on a, getting a, pro, a program like this ramped up, but then bam, you know, the demand just hit us, and, and we, we had people, so many applicants that are truly ready to go that we didn't have that money like we thought we would to provide a little bit more technical assistance. But nonetheless, from a you know, verbal and helpful perspective, the answer is a definite yes that we've been able to help um, some folks who just weren't quite ready yet. But I wanna be clear, we didn't have the money we thought we would to actually purchase like our, you know, extra architectural assistance because the demand all of a sudden was so high, which again are good problems. And now, you know, I think together we need to mature the, the program a little bit further uh, to, to meet the demand, discussion about criteria and so forth. Okay. All right. It comes to member uh, Dunbar and then Vice President Spadafore. Thank you. Um, in looking at a map, I, I'm, I understand that, that Downtown Inc. kind of stretches further than what we would necessarily and maybe the general public driving by would think of as, as downtown. Um, is there a way, um, because I understand that the, the intention was not to let this be used downtown where other resources are available, but I'm totally, and looking at where this guy is that, that Council Member Spitzley is talking about, nobody even from town thinks of that as downtown. So do we have to, when we use the term downtown, adhere to what used to be the DLI boundaries, or can it? Uh, we've been adhering to a, a couple, one I wanted to make sure to point out that that map you're looking at are last year's awardees, and literally because of the specificity, uh, Councilman Hussein, you're correct, there were no grants awarded to downtown last year at all. Right. So I just want I, I no, to be I, clear I, on that. And then secondly, typically we, yes, we use, um, you know, the downtown, uh, I forget which, uh, the, the number. Well, it's like the A or B. Yeah, a, thank you, it's a, not even a number, it's A or B, whatever it is, but we tend to follow that for downtown. Um, okay. Uh, trying to so identify, really when you but it's very immediate. We, okay. we, we try to be quite immediate about it. So yes, you can see Rio Town, for instance, is, I mean, some people think that might be downtown. Some people think Old Town might be downtown. Um, portions of Michigan Avenue, right around Pennsylvania Avenue. Um, but we were super tight about our definition of downtown. Okay, so what is being allowed under this amended definition of who can apply when you say it's been opened up to downtown are we excluding the a district and then you've got the b I, and c or is it it's i mean I, I just think it's basically from pennsylvania avenue to capitol okay. and from uh you know saginaw to 496 okay something like that okay yeah I also like to say that I, I, I mean, I, I, just to continue dialogue with you about, um, you know, downtown toolbox. It, it, I mean, I guess I just want to point out again that, I, I mean, obviously these decisions are up to you and the administration, but 
I mean, I don't think it's personally my personal opinion, I guess, that you know, downtown Lansing, that a downtown, the capital city of Michigan, has no facade program at all in its toolbox. And its DLI is, you know, the principal shopping district is one of the lowest assessment districts in the state of Michigan. I know a few years ago it was the single lowest. And essentially its budget is being used on maintenance issues, including beautification, the flowers, and putting on some limited events. But I mean, beyond that, it's, I, I, the, the TIFA, every penny of the TIFA is being used on debt. I wish to God for my 14 years with you that somehow, some way we had a normal TIFA, you know, that had money in it that could be used for all the, it's, it's still paying debt from decades ago all the way back to the Hollister administration, Hollister administration primarily. I wish it wasn't that, but I, I personally suggest to you that the idea of sort of this bigger or robust toolbox downtown is, is not really the way it is. I wish it were sort of, but it isn't. I have Vice President Spadafore, then Council Member Washington. I have three things. Uh, one, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I don't have a problem with us spending dollars on businesses wh wherever they are in the city, even downtown. My issue was that it changed without really deliberation around here. And you've answered my question on, on how that happened. Uh, secondly, is there a possibility when we write incentives and, and um, uh, packages that go with development to have parts of the, you know, sometimes we've done community improvement, um, you know, doing um, infrastructure like the EDS facility, those types of things, to have some sort of it on maybe case specific or area specific to go towards things like a facade improvement program. Um, to help with those kinds of things or, or helping with those types of activities around the city, the things you'd like the TIFA to work on but we can't because of the debt. Is that possible to incorporate in our incentive packages that you all put together and bring to us? Well, I, I absolutely love the thought. I mean, honestly, this is a very provocative thought. Um, Sorry. This, no, this is good. <laughs> I like it at least. I don't know whether everyone else will or not. Um, and again, I have to caution, I'm going to give a little bit more of my personal experiences to you on the issue, but uh, you know, the there are other, well, the city of Detroit, you know, has definitely put in place, um, they had two different ballot proposals for what they call community benefits associated with incentives. And they were very, very controversial. Um, essentially, one more than the other allowed neighborhood organizations to, without any cap or criteria or anything, make practically open-ended demands. And I know this isn't what you're suggesting at all, and, and it doesn't have to be that way. The city of Detroit voted on the lesser of the two ballots, um, but they do have something like that. The development community, um, you know, is pretty mixed. I'm being kind about it, probably, and, and what they think about those extra requirements, they feel like it's already a very costly endeavor. I'm not taking either side. I'm just uh, expressing to you some of the thoughts on this. So we do have the Universal Development Agreement, which um, tries to lay out from you to the developer certain criteria or demands, actually, I should put it more strongly, demands, yes. requirements about hiring local labor, lancing labor, um, and this kind of thing, which is, um, you know, puts us in a category of, of, there's probably not a lot of cities that even have that type of thing. Bigger cities have it. We're one of those bigger cities, so we would have something like that. I think it's appropriate. Um, but beyond that, it's really, to the best of my knowledge, actually been implemented in the city of Detroit. I know it's been discussed in Ypsilanti, maybe other cities I'm not aware of. Uh, is another point of maybe interest is the city of East Lansing has put in a 1% or $25,000, whatever is less, uh, that each project has to put in public art to that value. Relate, and I think it can be anywhere in the city. It doesn't have to be you know, directly part of their project. I thought that's an intriguing idea. Um, I always think, I wish these things would be sort of region-wide, that maybe if they're a good idea that all municipalities could adopt them, adopt them in our area. If they're, if they're a good idea for one, why not the rest of them? But those are my thoughts on it. I mean, I'm, I think we have to tread, you know, really carefully. Um, you know, we need to make sure that Lansing is a, in a strong enough position still, uh, demand, uh, supply and demand kind of way, and, and that um, 
that we've reached the right balance to encourage development and yet be responsible to the community as far as a return. Council member, were you done, Vice President Spadafor? Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to, one more thing was, I really appreciate the visuals and also you drive around town and you see this work being done. You don't necessarily realize it's it's part of this program, but it's really exciting work and we appreciate you guys implementing it with such fidelity and vigor too. It's really done a lot for these small businesses. Well, again, it's us that are thankful to Mayor Shore and all of you and I, Adam Hussein, I guess you jarred my memory. We, we did talk about that uh, a few years ago, but the, it's contagious, you know, and that's what's the really cool part of it. I mean, you can see it literally in the number of applications and uh, these are all good problems to have and we can continue to resolve them together and mature the program, if you will, to meet the new demand. But neighbor, there's nothing like uh, pressure of neighbors to neighbors, you know, trying to improve property values and property looks. Um, that way is so much more effective than government regulation and that kind of thing. Councilmember Washington. Um, thank you, Madam President. I'm just going to wrap up with this. I really like this program. I really want to make sure that it is spread around. You know, we do talk about, oh, maybe downtown doesn't have as much as we think they do, but the other places have nothing. And I would caution us against doing anything with community benefits attached to these facade grants because these are small businesses. They're coming to us because they need help, not because they have more and more to give. And when it comes to the bigger developers, I kind of resent it when people think that we do nothing with these bigger developers. We demand that they engage the neighborhood before they put in a final design. So the neighborhood always has say in what happens. We have demanded local labor for anything with an incentive. We have demanded that they make sure that they have the appropriate facade and dare I say artwork as far as even in the bike the biking. So I really resent it when people talk about this community benefit because maybe we don't call it that, but we get exactly that. With the EDS program, with the apartments that are going up um, down on the southeast side of the city, and we have done so much as an administration and as a council to ensure that these things are in place. This is not a new idea in Lansing. In fact, we may be the forerunners, particularly in demanding local labor for projects, local labor first. So, um, so I, I'm a little touchy about that because we have gone to great lengths, and you know as well as I do, Bob, to ensure that the community is always involved in all of our projects. But like I said, I would caution us against putting stricter ties to these small facade grants when they're coming to us because they don't have much. Yeah, well, of course, it's the administration and the council. I'm just, you know, me. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, I agree with you. I think what you're saying, and I, I would agree with it, I think the city of Lansing has done a very good job for a major urban city to reach the right balance of wanting to encourage development. And in my opinion, the city of Lansing needs to be very careful about not slowing that down. I mean, uh, Lansing needs to really work very, very hard to continue to attract and recruit business and developers. Um, I, and uh, and yet, I think we've got, uh, you know, See. struck the right balance in a, a pretty tough uh, universal development agreement and labor discussions and, and, as you pointed out, even some other requirements. Uh, the Red Cedar Project, we require them to pay for and hold uh, three, um, what do they call them? Uh, the town, I want to call them town hall meetings, charrettes, thank you. You know, town hall meetings in neighborhood groups. I went to all of them, so did you. Mm -hmm. And I still think that to this day that really most of that project being proposed that Brian probably has in his office now is essentially what was uh, jointly designed or listened to or however you want to characterize it, but from those neighborhood meetings, I really do. Trails, parks, water features. Um, and a pretty good mixed use of, of uh, different kinds of uses, yeah. I have Councilmember Spitzley and Councilmember Garza, and then I have a couple of comments, and we're going to um, ask you while you're sitting there, oh, and Councilmember Hussein, while you're sitting there um, to think about um, a date that we could have you back in October. There's no way we're going to be able to continue to move on, and this has been a robust 
yeah. discussion, and we still have other things that we want to hear from from you as well. So with that, Councilmember Spitzley, Garza, and Hussein. Thank you, Madam President. I mean that brings that brings us up to a different subject. I mean, what are what are your um, tools in the toolbox that you use to go out and attract business? What's your how's your business attractive pro business attraction program, um, and and what have been the benefits of that? I mean. Can you, do you have a round number of how much economic development has been brought into the city in the last year? And you're talking specifically business attraction efforts? Yeah, we have all those measurables, reports. Um, the attract, if you're talking specific, and this is where um, I would love to, I mean, the answer is yes, coming back in October. I only got to our first two points. I know. I mean, I really didn't get to the report, to be honest about it. I, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll defer then and talk I'd love over, to talk but, to you about but it. But that is something that I think is important, and it's, it's a good metric. As we, yeah. as we talk about um, the, the incentives that the city of Lansing right. offers or works with between your office and, and Mr. McGrain's office, I think that sometimes there is a learning curve over how those incentives are used and, and the tools that you guys use to attract business. And, mm -hmm. and, and the TIF is a perfect example of that right. folks, sometimes they don't understand that it's not a tax increase. It's, it's capturing those taxes from the, from the increased taxes because of that development. And, and it sounds funny even me saying it. And so yeah. I think we need to do a better job of um, educating our public and our residents on what that stuff is and the benefits. And so I, I would appreciate if you come back in October and talk about economic development and business attraction and incentives in general. Well, I accept your invitation if that's what I heard. And yes, I've been and, very and eager for a long time to talk about LEAP because the, the cool thing about all this is, you know, we have a city of Lansing contract and that is done through the Lansing EDC and um, that, provides you know certain kinds of services you, you know what they are facade corridor improvement authorities and working on buildings as an example Carl and I, I I mean well let's just take the last two weeks and I really apologize to Carl and Chris poor guys are over here uh, probably stewing at this point wanting to add in I know that's true but <laughs> um, but I mean it, it the the last two weeks alone three weeks uh, me, me to some extent, but way, 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 way more. Carl uh, has led a really ferocious and complicated negotiation between the Red Cedar developers and the city of Lansing. And I'm not joking, uh, a dozen plus attorneys and bond attorneys. I mean, I led the first meeting, Carl was out of town and it's quite possible there were 30 attorneys total in the room. And Jim was there as well. He's one of them. Okay, maybe 15. But there were a lot of them. More than I've ever seen, let me just say that. But the point is, is that Carl and Greg Venker has been amazing in Smirka. It's a total team effort, don't get me wrong here. But Carl has led a very complicated, you know, large group of, of people through a complicated conversation which culminated in the Lansing Brownfield Authority last Friday morning approving uh, finally the, the bonds that we're gonna sell, recall, not at the obligation or faith and credit of the city or the Brownfield Authority. But I mean, the point what I'm trying to get at is Carl spent quite possibly several, well, 100 plus hours for sure over the last three weeks or four weeks putting just that project together. So between facade, quarter proven authorities, and Chris and Carl, Lake Trust, Chris would have a similar story. Chris spent 10 months recruiting CB Mining, which was a company uh, from okay. Columbus. Bob, okay. I, I love you, but <laughs> the, the I issue is- I look forward is, to coming back. We're, we're, we're asking you I was you only back. warming up. And, so. and we have October 14th and uh, October 28th. So you need to get with Sherry and let us know which one of those okay. uh, will work. Uh, we had hoped when we started this agenda, um, and Sherry said how much time to give them, I said there's nothing on the agenda so they can have almost the entire time. Well, as you saw, one thing after another got added and, uh, and that, and sometimes those things 
um, happen, but it's been important for council members to be able to have this robust discussion with yes. you and to listen to um, all the things that, that are happening and for the public to understand those as, as well. So I have Councilmember Garza, Councilmember Hussein. I have a couple of comments and then we'll move on. Councilmember Garza. Thank you, Madam President. And you know, I was gonna use the segue when you said attract and recruit, um, but Patricia beat me to the punchline. So uh, she was a little faster getting her hand up. <laughs> um, and, and that's what I was gonna ask. You know, how are you, we attracting, how are we recruiting uh, uh, development, and particularly South Lansing, you know? Um, I've been beating down the doors of all these new developers that are coming in town and and businesses coming into Southeast Lansing, and I'm asking, you know, hey, what, what can I do to help? Um, I see that you still have storefronts that are, are open. You know, have you heard of Leap? And I haven't heard of anybody say they've heard of you guys yet. So I've been directing them to you, whether they con are contacting you or not. I know one in particular did, but um, I think it'd be cool to have a, maybe a billboard on the highway as you're coming into Lansing, you know, with your name on it, just to let people know, or or some kind of outreach. Well, not our name, your name. I mean, Lansing. The exactly, but but what you guys do, you know, to maybe these developers oh. coming in town or there, we, business owners. This is why I really look forward to a lot better time because I understand what you're saying, but I'm going to suggest to you that um, there are way more effective ways to in this in this day and age to market. And, and to talk to customers, and, and I, I really look forward to talking about that. I know exactly what you're saying, and uh, it's a complicated conversation. Our Which we will have yes. on either the 14th or the 28th. <laughs> and they do a good job. Uh, okay. Right. So I won't be here on the 28th, so I hope it's the 14th. But, uh, um, and, and on top of that, maybe one more thing to think about I was going to ask you is opportunity zones. I'd like to hear how that's going in South Lansing. Well, I, I probably can do that truly in one minute. Uh, if if you promise me one it minute. Is co it's complicated too. I um, really congratulate Mayor Shore and really all of you, but it's Mayor fine. Shore has been seen as a leader in the United States on the Opportunity <laughs> Zone issue. Um, a NUM, I, you all know a NUM on our staff, she switched over to our new economy division, a job opening there. Her real passion is with entrepreneurialism. But the prospectus that she put together for the city of Lansing and the Opportunity Zones has been sought out by some of the biggest cities all over America. I'm not kidding. She has given presentations with Mayor Shore uh, about Lansing being really way ahead of 99%. Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, um, oh, I'm leaving out two or three other, Flint, uh, they have all called us and asked a numb and Mayor Shore to share and talk about our opportunity zones. So we've learned a lot, we presented, when you talk about marketing, I mean, um, you know, we've been literally all over the United States online and in person promoting the city of Lansing via our great work with the opportunity zones. I would like to make this one um, hardcore observation though about opportunity zones. I worried about it from the beginning and my worry continues too. I just want to be completely honest about it. My observation is there were so many opportunity zones everywhere, all over the United States, every community, everywhere, that in my judgment, what I'm, I worry about then and really what I'm seeing so far is that developers are, are putting their money into sites that they were already definitely putting their money into and that they are simply taking advantage of the tax break. And that I think um, opportunity zones, we need to continue to work hard. And I think, you know, we can here in Lansing, but you know, th there's an open-ended question maybe in my opinion about whether they are truly driving somebody to a location, low to moderate income location that they otherwise would not have selected. So far, I am seeing no evidence of that. Okay, Council Member Hussein. I, I'm glad that you guys will be coming back. Um, I've, I've said this often that I don't think we talk about economic development enough, to be quite frank. Um, and if you if you look at you know the things that we do talk about, whether it be public safety, I mean, if you want if you want safer communities, you you need to promote economic development. Uh, if you want better roads, you need to pr promote economic development. If you want 
um, to reverse some of the urban decay uh, along your commercial corridors that are connecting your front door communities that you want to support, you want to create stronger neighborhoods, then you need to pr promote economic development. So we need to be talking about it and talking about it and talking about it um, and making sure that we're uh, you know, problem solving some of the issues that we're seeing in the city. Uh, with that being said, um, I do want to say thank you. Uh, I think LEAP uh, over the last few years uh, has done a, a pretty incredible job um, and I can, I'll can i speak, you know, obviously, uh, you know, my focus is Southwest Lansing, my hyper focus is Southwest Lansing, uh, Pleasant Grove and Homes uh, and some of the things that we've done with the Southwest Lansing initiative uh, with the plan that was put in place and, and the fact that you guys have worked hard to make sure that plan has not just collected dust on a shelf somewhere. I appreciate that and some of the support that you guys are providing uh, to some of the entities over there that are in place uh, to do some of the really important work in terms of revitalizing that district. I really appreciate the corridor improvement authority uh, piece of it and the support that you guys have provided there uh, and, and obviously some of the, the small businesses you guys are supporting, whether that be Soldens, whether that be Bacon Cakes, whether that be um, Hannah, Chris, Anum, Bob, Carl, you guys are always accessible. I really appreciate that. You guys come to Southwest Lansing. You've been to a number of my meetings and things of that nature. Uh, so we certainly appreciate that. There's, there's always certainly uh, room for improvement, uh, but I do really appreciate your team. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Hussein. Uh, just briefly, one of the things was we were talking about the facade grants that maybe we could think about um, is the fact that maybe we could have a banner or a clapboard or something that where we are doing those that says that this is a project being done through the facade grants. We've um, talked about that a lot. Yep. You know, I mean, people, as comments were made here, people weren't aware that some of those projects that we've seen improvements on were done with that until we got the sheet. So that might be um, something to think about. And I would encourage you, since Council Member um, Garza had said that he's going to be gone on the 28th, to really consider the 14th on that. So um, with that, we thank you, and we'll look forward to you getting with Sherry. And for those of you that didn't get a chance to speak, you'll get a chance the next time you come. So thank you. Uh, we really appreciate all of you and Mayor Shore. Thank yes. you. Yes. And Brian McGrain. All right. Next on the agenda, we have the, uh, under other, we have the resolution uh, dealing with Kroger's. And this has to do, um, as um, Mr. Swartz said, um, the uh, free newspapers, whether it's the Lansing City Pulse or others that are located at Kroger's. We did a similar resolution when Myers um, had the same um, argument that was out there. And um, we've been asked to um, do this resolution, encouraging them to keep the publications and allow the public to have those. Are there any questions on this? Council Member Washington. Madam President, I just wanna make a quick comment regarding this. Um, I do not always like what the city pulse prints about me, but I will defend them to my death to be a paper and to get that news out there and by any means necessary. And I know particularly in my ward, a lot of people pick up the print, the printed version of this uh, newspaper. So I would encourage all of us to support this resolution 100%. Uh, Vice President Spadafor. I was just going to move the resolution uh, urging, cur encouraging Kroger to change their policy and resume allowing publications to offer their free newspapers and to support the public notification process. All right, we have a motion before us. Are there any questions? Yes, Council Member, uh, Vice President Spadafore. Not a question, just a comment. And I don't remember if, if Burrow mentioned or not, but a lot of the business that this body does is published in the City Pulse, so it's one of the only ways that folks who aren't following um, Joe, uh, Council Member Washington on Facebook know what's going on at the uh, City Council Chamber. So it's very important to the, the work of this body that it's available to the residents of this city. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. This will be on the um, agenda for this evening. Um, before us, we also have two resolutions and I know that we've discussed this before, but these are the corridor resolutions. If you remember last time, um, we had to do a reconsideration on them because there was um, a uh, problem with the distance um, that was on them. 
And so we re, uh, reconsidered them and then uh, redid them and uh, was out there for a, setting a public hearing. Unfortunately, what happened after the public hearing was published um, that was not caught in, uh, again by uh, the clerk's office or the attorneys or us or you know anybody else that saw the notice um, was the fact that it didn't tell where the public hearing was going to be held. So we're being asked to do these resolutions again and they will be published again with the location so that people are able to come and speak. Now, um, there is the potential that people will show up uh, here because they're used to public hearings, uh, being here at City Hall on um, the 23rd. Um, uh, so we will take their comments at, at that time. So with that, what we need is a motion to have these on the agenda this evening. Do you want that specific motion? Or one for motion, one for resolution. One for each okay. resolution. I would move the um, passage of the resolution for the Lansing Gateway Corridor Improvement Authority for consideration tonight at City Council, setting the public hearing for October fourteenth, two thousand nineteen. All right, we have a motion before us. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes. The next one, Vice President Spadafore. Yeah, real quick. Uh, neither one of these has a time in the resolution, so let's just make sure when it's published, the time is published. Yes. Okay. So. Mr. Clerk's back there shaking his okay, head good. going, yes. All right, I would move the second resolution for the South Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard Corridor Improvement Authority um, to set a public hearing for October 14th, 2019 at 7 p.m. to be considered by the City Council tonight. All right, we have a motion in front of us. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Again, you've got your budget priorities uh, with you. We will be taking those up. Most of the committees have um, looked at them and made different recommendations um, to staff. Um, so we still have a meeting or two with committees that need to get done to pass that forward. Um, we will be taking these up on the 30th uh, because they have to be passed um, by October 1st. So uh, with that, we are going to adjourn for five minutes and then we will reconvene. We are adjourned. <laughs>